Hello and welcome. This episode is taken from the live soundtrack of a broadcast I did some months ago. I hope you find it useful. Well, hello and good evening. And um, here we are again. Uh, Barry Winbolt here. I'm going to be talking about the myth of communication breakdown, uh, prompted by a post I wrote some time ago and, um, and then a question I had in the preceding week. Communication breakdown. Why do I think it's a myth? Why do I have a particular beef about this expression? Well, in my work as a mediator, conflict resolver, um, even as a therapist, I've come across it quite often that people use the term communication breakdown as though it's some sort of explanation of what's going on. And all too frequently, I think it's used as an excuse for going no further, in particular with attempts to resolve a conflict. That's why I think it's it's a, a misnomer and it's unhelpful for a start. Cars and washing machines break down, communications don't. You cannot not communicate. So even a refusal to communicate is a communication that you don't want to communicate. And uh, a mismatched communication where there's wide misunderstanding or it's generating disagreement or conflict is nevertheless a communication. It's not helpful to refer to things in terms of communication breakdown. It's not a mechanical process. And um, I get the drift. It's a metaphor and that's absolutely fine. But the problem with the metaphor is you should never take it seriously. That is to say you shouldn't take it literally. Take it seriously by all means if you like, but uh, it shouldn't be taken literally. And we speak in metaphors and they're very, very powerful. But in terms of dealing hands-on with bringing people together, whether one is an observer of somebody else's conflict or whether one is actually involved in a conflict oneself, thinking in terms of communication breakdown is very often a way of saying there's an impasse, and when there's an impasse, you don't go any further. Uh, in many people's minds. And I, I disagree with that because I think it's unhelpful. Equally, I mean, it, it happens a lot around bullying. I've done quite a lot of work around um, helping groups of managers to conduct themselves in such a manner that they won't attract allegations of bullying behavior because uh, there's been a rise in that in, the, in recent years, rise in accusations, I think, uh, because of the widespread misuse of the word bullying or misunderstanding about the word bullying. And again, you see, it's an abstract concept. Bullying is a very specific sequence of events, set of circumstances. It doesn't mean what it's come to mean in many cases, which is, I don't like the way I'm being spoken to. So I won't go into, into bullying in great detail now. That's not my point. My, my point is that we often become the victim of terms we use to describe events because the terms appear to act as an explanation, but they are an explanation of nothing. Because bullying can cover such a wide range of behaviours, a wide range of perceptions, and in the same way, communication breakdown says nothing about what's going on. I'm going to talk a little bit later about how I think we could talk about it more usefully and what I think we could do about it. So communication breakdown is the topic, why I think it's a myth, uh, the idea uh, that actually something breaks down when a communication breakdown is supposed to have occurred is nonsense, in my view, because communications can't break down. We all communicate all the time, whether we like it or not. I get that it's a metaphor, and I understand that, and it's a useful one in that regard. However, we shouldn't take it seriously or literally, more to the point. And when people do, that's when the problem occurs. And when I've come across it, as I said earlier in my work as a mediator, um, conflict resolver, family therapist and so forth, when I've come across it and it's been used uh, in the context of other people in conflict, it's generally been used to mean these two people aren't speaking to each other anymore and it's gone as far as it can and there's some sort of blockage and they... They won't make up and they can't get on. And my, that is my starting point. My starting point is that we cannot not communicate, so we might as well learn how to communicate despite the so-called communication breakdown. Because I think, to put it bluntly, the term is a cop-out. It just says, um, along with a number of other phrases we use in our professional lives, it's an excuse to go no further. So here's what I think you do. 
I think that the first thing you have to do is consider that uh, a communication to breakdown isn't any sort of breakdown at all. It's just another form of communication. And it's communicating that we are not getting along at all. We are not able to communicate or whatever it happens to be communicating. We're not making any headway. So what do you do at that point? Well, let's talk about if you're involved in that communication, if you're involved in that dispute, difference, whatever it is that has led to a communication breakdown. The first thing you need to do is to step back, of course. We know that as, uh, as common sense. Take a more dispassionate view. Disconnect yourself in as far as possible. In other words, adopt, um, adopt an observer's stance. So stand back and imagine yourself there, but stand back and look at the interaction in terms of what is actually happening. She is shouting at me. He has stopped speaking at me. I've been able to, unable to express myself without getting angry. And therefore, I'm saying things that are upsetting the other person. Describe what's going on as a dispassionate reporter or observer. So you report instead of trying to control the conversation. That's the first thing that one can do. Now, in order to report, you have to observe. In order to observe, you have to step back. It can take quite an act of will. It can take training. And sometimes it means you'll need to take a break before you can actually have the conversation you need to have with the other person. It may even be that you have to break totally in order to write down your thoughts and map out, and conflict resolvers call it conflict mapping, who said what to whom. But do make sure that whatever your report is, whether it's verbal or written, that, and by the way, if it's written, it's for your eyes only. It's not to start firing off missives to other people. Do make sure that it is objective, dispassionate, and not loaded with judgmental language, accusations, implicit criticisms, blame, or any of the things that get in the way of conversations. So step one, find a way to step back and observe, and report for your own benefit on what's happening. The next step is to start, and by the way, you should always keep lines of communication open. So rule number one is never let communications totally end. Keep them going in some way. Even if the other person isn't open to it, you just say now and again in some way, hi, I'm still alive. I know there's a problem. I haven't gone away. I still think we need to resolve it, whatever you say. Keep the lines of communication open. Now, by the way, I would just say that there is no hard and fast guarantee that every conflict can be resolved, that every dispute can be agreed. But at least you're taking steps to do what is most likely at some point in the future to be able to resolve or find some dialogue between the people concerned. So keep communications open, step back and observe the um, and report dispassionately instead of trying to control the conversation. And as soon as you reasonably can, start a conversation about how the two of you be, have been communicating with each other. Now, this is going to be tough because you have to leave out accusations. You have to leave out blame, as I said earlier. But when I came into the room, you looked upset I overreacted or I was upset too. I raised my voice. You then raised your voice. Now, this isn't accusatory language. This is purely reporting. This is journalism. You're just saying what happened. It's a documentary. Imagine there was a camera up on the wall recording your every word and every move. Take the emotion out of your description and start the conversation along those lines because then that gives you information about the interaction which can be addressed. So how would you like to continue convert discussing this in future? Well, I don't want you shouting at me. So how would you like me to behave towards you? Well, I'd like you to speak reasonably towards me. And I expect you'd like to know how I'd like you to act towards me. Whatever it happens to be, observe, report, and create some sort of dispassionate conversation, which, as I've acknowledged, may not be in the moment possible, it may take a little time. In the meantime, keep communications open at all costs. Don't uh, think that you can 
fix it just like that. If something goes pear-shaped, if it goes wrong in, a, in an interaction like that, then a good starting point is always the beginning. It's to go back to the beginning and start again. It's to refresh the conversation under different circumstances, different time, at a time when it's easier to have it without inflaming each other's sensibility. And of course, if you are a conflict resolver managing two other people, the same goes, take a break, take a breath, and bring the people together at such time as they can have a conversation. They may still be frustrated, angry, heated, but the language can be, at such time as the language can be moderated. Whether you're in the conversation or observing the conversation as a, as a third party mediator or conflict resolver, ask intelligent questions. Now, I put a lot of effort into this in my training events and also in my own work. We don't ask very bright questions very often. And take a leaf out of the Solution Focused Therapist's book. Um, be extremely curious and ask creative questions. Now, the interesting thing about a powerful question is that it takes the responder somewhere else in their mind. So if somebody is on a particular train of thought about a particular dispute or a particular issue they have with somebody else, your questions can take them into a different place where they have to think differently in order to, walk, to uh, respond to it. Now, you can only do that when you've set the scene, when you've taken the first steps I spoke about a little earlier, and you've established some sort of basis for conversation. It's no good firing questions when they don't want to answer them. They just sound like accusations. But if your questions are well-formed, if they're honed, if they're carefully tuned to the situation, and above all, dispassionate and interested in that person's point of view, in how it is for them, in what they think, in what outcome they want, and so on and so forth. There are uh, any number of questions in the universe. There, it's unlimited the numbers of questions you can make up. And yet so many people get stuck with a very tightly prescribed list of questions, which don't help anybody, really. They don't take uh, the disputants, if, if that's who you're working with, they don't take the people anywhere else other than back into the problem they're stuck with. And that's not the place to go when people are trying to resolve something in their lives. Because as a number of people have said, uh, you don't solve Gregory Bates, among others, you don't solve the problem at the same logical level that creates it. So it's our job if we're working with others or if we are the person who needs to solve our own problem, it's our job at that point in time to get out of the logical level that's causing the problem, to break away from the type of thinking that we're stuck with that's actually got us into that corner in the first place, and move to a place where we can ask, answer questions differently or ask ourselves different questions. I think that's incredibly important. Now, the onus is on, of course, if you are a, a, a therapist, conflict resolver, mediator, the onus is on us, the professionals, on you to lead that conversation. And if you can't, the limitation is yours. It's not the limitation of the parties in dispute because they're running around like two chickens with their heads cut off and they're not able to uh, break out of the, the, the spot that got them into the difficulty in the first place. So our job, surely, is to lead people to a new place. And we can do that through your asking the right sorts of questions. Now, you can actually, by the way, download a list of questions on my website. Go into the search box on barrywinbolt.com and you key in solution-focused questions. You should come up with a, with a download. If you get stuck, send me an email. So questions, terribly important. If you are dealing with the aforesaid supposed communication breakdown, then I think it's our role to be supportively tenacious. You know, we're just not going to let go. The option, whether you are in the conflict or managing the conflict between other people, the option is not to break down and get out of it. The option is to hang in there until it's sorted, whatever that means. And that requires some sort of collaboration. 
Now, the skill of uh, the conflict resolver, of course, is to be able to bring about those conversations, but it's within the scope of all of us. As long as we don't use phrases like, oh, communication breakdown, there's nothing I can do about it. So, there we have it for tonight. That's why I think communication breakdown, that notion of communication breakdown is a, is a myth. I hope it's uh, shaken up some thinking a bit for you or given you a couple of ideas. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments box and all the best until next time. Well, notwithstanding the slightly iffy audio quality, I hope you found it thought provoking. Please leave a comment or let me know at info at barrywimbolt.com. Just send me an email. For now, that's all from me. Thank you for joining me and I hope you'll tune in another time. All the best. Goodbye.